I find it really interesting that Resident Evil Village is using American accents. Considering its somewhat medieval inspirations, pulling from symbolism and imagery of classic horror movies, Castle Dimitris and the nearby as yet unnamed village surrounding it have more visual similarities to Dracula's Transylvania or Frankenstein's Darmstadt than the Baker Estate. And considering the geographic similarities between Village and Resident Evil 4, it looks like the 2021 release is going to twist our fear of the other where Resi 4 embraced it. Horror, great horror at least, is able to dissect the fear of the year and mutate it into something tangible for us to confront. You don't need to be a racist to experience some small level of xenophobia in the broadest sense. I'm sure if tomorrow aliens landed, your excitement and intrigue would be coloured by a level of distrust. After all, that's what xenophobia is. A fear of strangers, of outsiders, of the other. Where Resident Evils 1, 2 and 3 used a familiar city location and mansion so its focus could be on its body horror, Resident Evil 4 is more interested in dropping us into the strange and unfamiliar. For Spanish speakers, a couple of the tactics adopted here will be less powerful, obviously, but it's not just that Resident Evil 4 takes us out of Raccoon City and throws us into rural Spain that's so unnerving, because aside from the language of the Ganados, this isn't rural Spain, or at least not a realistic depiction of it. It's a warped and otherly version of it. There's a lot of gorgeous little horror tactics Resident Evil 4 employs in its opening, but it's all in service of establishing a fear of the other. So let's break down how it does that. This is the first 10 minutes. I received special training via a secret organization working under the direct control of the president. I was to assume the responsibility of protecting the new president's family. Six years after the events of Resident Evil 1, Leon Sweetbuns Kennedy has been sent to Spain to look for the president's daughter. The game's first shot is of the world outside of the car, focusing on thin spiked branches. The colour palette of browns and greys makes everything look grimy and dull. Due to the sharpness of the HD remaster, everything looks just too sharp and crisp to get the full effect, but when it released on the GameCube and later on the PlayStation 2, that blurred look made every scene look goopy. The flamenco song diegetically playing from the radio is a tune, but more importantly, it's lyricless. A warbling female singer is vocalising, but because the song is lacking in lyrics, it preys on a player's ignorance, establishing the otherness of this countryside. This might be a reach, but I also think it's worth noting that flamenco music dates back to the mid-19th century, created by Spanish Gitanos, travellers who would never stay too long in one place. It's music of another time, particularly in this style, and it adds to how Resident Evil 4's dated setting clashes with the modern time period. The two police who are escorting Leon are hostile, mocking. Resident Evil 4's dialogue is cheesy and the exposition is very, very heavy-handed, but the word choice is specific in reminding us how isolated and alone Leon is in this strange new land. You're a long way from home, cowboy, you crazy American. In just this opening cutscene, the game repeats and repeats the importance of Leon being alone in the wilderness. That he's far from his usual setting, and if you're a fan of the series, picking up the controller for Leon's latest adventure, you are as well. Resident Evil 4 Spain has more in common with magical realism than a realistic interpretation. The accents of the policia, despite speaking English, is actually closer to Mexican English rather than Spanish English. Everything about the presentation of the game feels just a little bit off. And whether that's purposeful or just poor translation, it's still effective in breeding a sense of the other. That malicious glee that we noticed back in Resident Evil 1 returns with Resident Evil 4. Leon chides his escorts, asking them if they expect to sit around a bonfire singing Kumbaya together. It's a bullish statement that presents Leon as confident and full of bravado despite his strange surroundings, but it's also a really tasteless joke which gets its punchline when we reach the bonfire later and find one of the officers burning. Gross. The switch from close-up angles while in the safety of the car to wider, more distant shots purposefully draws attention to just how vast the new player space is. 
There's an emphasis on distant threats, watching us, never far behind, which carries the tone of the first half of the game. The environment itself appears to be alive, reacting to our presence, and that's noted when the officer is having a waz and the temperature suddenly drops, like the woods are purposefully changing. Once the car pulls up on the outskirts of the village by minute three, the fact that the brash officers are suddenly nervous about what lies ahead sets up the player's expectations for what horrors are in store. Shinji Mikami's fingerprints are all over this introduction, carrying over the ploy of setting off cocky characters who drop to scared victims by kickoff. Leon, I hope you can hear me. I'm Ingrid Hunnigan. I'll be your support on this mission. The fact that Ingrid Hunnigan's first note of concern is whether or not Leon can hear her once again reinforces how isolated Leon is. He's as far from civilization as the US government can possibly imagine, to the point where they fear that their communications equipment won't even have signal. The communications device is a really smart tool on the whole. The player begins to rely on it for support as the story progresses. Hunnigan is constantly keeping us informed and even uses it at pivotal moments to call in backup for Leon. But once the player reaches the midpoint, they get to have that safety net ripped out from under them when Ramon Salazar and Lord Sadler both hijack the device, further secluding Leon from friendly faces as the situation grows more dire. There's no music once gameplay is handed to the player, just the environmental sounds of rushing water, the squawk of crows and wind blowing through the trees, maximising the distance that we feel from hustle and bustle and safety. Despite the jokes at the beginning, this has so far been a quiet, slow opening setting the tone of unfamiliarity to the player. Of course, this changes once Leon meets his first Ganado. The architecture of the cabin is bare and dull, the wallpaper peels, the floor is hollow wood, some of the windows don't even have glass in them, all indicating to the player that this is a little society out of time. But the ordinary chore which the Ganado is doing when we first confront him lulls us into a false sense of security. He's just stoking the fire, minding his own business. His eyes, his complexion, his clothing is all strange, yes, in keeping with the otherness of the setting, but he doesn't seem… murdery. Well, we called that wrong. The way the first person perspective sways as our enemy staggers towards Leon is similar to how a zombie might move, but we know that our enemy isn't a zombie. He can speak, he has hand-eye coordination, so the weirdness of this attack is what sets our teeth on edge. But that isn't all, is it? Probably one of the most ingenious design choices of Resident Evil 4 was having the Ganados speak a strange pigeon Spanish. If you don't speak Spanish, this language will sound alien to you, confusing, and will throw you off when initially assessing this threat. But because it's a foreign language, it sounds intelligent, adding a level of menace to our enemies. The signs dotted around the village also read in Spanish text, meaning our sense of direction isn't helped while we navigate the forestry. But better yet, if you do speak Spanish, you'll recognise that while the words and phrases reflect your own language, they're mongrelized and butchered slightly. Just a cursory look online shows that Spanish players find Resi 4's depiction of Spain funny rather than offensive, and acknowledge that it adds to the unsettling nature of the location. It's Spain, but not. And later, just as the player begins to get used to hearing the same familiar phrases roared over and over, the game transports you to a castle where the enemies chant Latin to broaden just how sequestered we truly are. When Leon barks freeze at our first Ganado, there's an uncertainty about whether or not our enemy isn't stopping because he doesn't understand us, or because he's in a plague-ridden daze. Of course, if you've played the game, you know the answer to that question, but as far as first impressions go, the game is really focusing on discombobulating you through your fear of the other. With a couple of shots to the head, the Ganado goes down quite easily, easier than many of Resident Evil's other grizzlies, that's for sure, but again, it sets up this expectation that maybe this is going to be… easy. But Spain's danger mainly comes from its mobs. With a cutaway to the car, we see it pull away as our escorts try to flee, but the game instills a sense of overwhelming panic with the two tight close-ups of Leon's eyes peeking through the window and the zoom out as we hear them scream and the car crash. Shit. 
the player doesn't have long to register the sudden mortal peril they're in until a small ambush appears outside the front of the cabin, and we get to feel as a player just how dangerous the Ganados are in their numbers. They're fast, faster for sure than zombies ever were, and they're intelligent, barking orders at each other to flank us, occasionally dodging our shots, and again, because we don't fully understand them, we don't necessarily know what orders they're yelling at each other. This isn't a military shooter. We can't hear a commanding officer yell at soldiers to flank us or that they're going on the left. All of this is confusing, and because it's confusing, it gets under the player's skin. This is really where the player needs to get to firm grips with the combat. We are just over six minutes in, and it already feels like Resident Evil 4 has thrown us in at the deep end. Just because the camera perspective has changed to behind Leon's shoulder, purposefully showcasing the breadth of areas and the many holes enemies can leap out from, doesn't mean that controlling him is any easier than the tank controls in older titles. They're still here, adding to the tension of each combat encounter. Leon rotates like a breakdancer when he's trying to change direction, and he can only travel forwards or backwards, meaning when you're trying to move left or right, you're actually closing the gap between you or an enemy. As a result, distance is a factor once again. Leon needs to stop in his tracks to aim at an enemy or even to reload, and because the Ganados are speedy buggers, if you want to get a good shot at an enemy's head, you need to momentarily open yourself up to attacks from all sides, prioritizing precision over blindly firing at your body. This is especially because the handgun has a distinct delay between shots, again ramping up the tension during ambushes. Resident Evil 4, above all else, tests a player's ability to remain calm under pressure. After this small ambush tutorializes mob enemies, Leon can, if the player wishes, travel back to where the car and the officers were at the start. If he does so, he'll find the car has crashed off the edge of a cliff and the bridge has been destroyed, Evil Dead style. So not only is the player a stranger in a strange foreign land, they're also now cut off from the outside world, lacking in a vehicle and their only allies are dead. We are eight minutes in and loneliness is beginning to thaw Leon's cool confidence. The trip mines and rescuing the dog caught in a bear trap are the game's way of doubling down on the intelligence of our enemies. They're not just mindless zombies anymore. They plot and plan and have built an entire small civilization with the intention of protecting themselves from us. Because to them, we are an other. Despite there being a simple path to follow to the village, the architecture of the woods feels broader and like it's hiding a million watching eyes because of the grimy shading. That brown and grey colour palette bleeds together, broken up purely by the sharp trees and branches and black crows which bluster into life, making the player paranoid, tricking us for a second that they're an enemy smashing out of the wilderness. Before the village, we find a ramshackle cabin which adds to the mystery of the Ganados. We find a woman pinned to the interior wall by a pitchfork, the, the most grotesque image we've seen yet. For reasons beyond us, the Ganados even butcher their own in supremely violent ways. The lack of explanation here adds new layers to the weirdness of our new enemies. By minute 10, Leon reaches the village centre and we see the bonfire burning with our old friend cooking up a juicy steak. Despite the shock of this image, the villagers seem unfazed by it, going about their daily business until we cross into their eyeline, and the game throws a huge mob at the player. Even the most adept of us will be overwhelmed by the game's use of procedural difficulty, adding more enemies which drop less resources if you're kicking just too much ass. But better yet, if the player dives into one of the nearby houses, the game has one last trick up its sleeve that I want to talk about, even if it does bring us over the 10 minute mark. We hear the roaring sound of a chainsaw, and the infamous Dr. Salvador appears. We hear him long before we see him, Leon muttering, are you kidding me? A chainsaw? And this is where we begin to see his cool guy aesthetic break in the face of all this weirdness. The fact that Salvador is A, just a standard enemy, and B, can kill Leon in one hit if he's not paying attention, isn't even the creepiest thing about him. It's the bag on his head. The ambushes and mobs Leon has faced in his first 10 minutes have been eerie and bizarre, but the player has at least grown accustomed to the appearance of the Ganados. They're still otherly, but the game doesn't rest on its laurels with the strange behaviour in foreign language. It's always trying to add new weirdness into Resident Evil 4, and our chainsaw happy boy is the cherry on the cake to finish the game's opening. 
The bag masks his identity. We can't see his face, we can't hear his voice, which makes him even more detached from reality than his Ganado brethren. And this makes our fear of the other start to bleed. Thanks for watching. This is video 4 of 7 in a breakdown of the openings of the mainline Resident Evil games in advance of a larger critique of Resident Evil Village next month. If you liked what you saw, like and drop a comment below for that sweet sweet algorithm energy, and as always, take care.